What's that? It's pretty hard. It is a hard game, but um, it's harder than you expect to program it. Um, so someone said to me as they came in, I can't remember who it is, oh, only because I've got this flu and I'm completely out of it today. Someone said, oh, I don't like chess anymore. I used to like it. I don't hate it now. <laughs> because the thing is, although it's hard to play the game in terms of strategy and being a really good chess player, the rules aren't that hard to understand. It's fairly straightforward. You would think it would be an easy thing to code just to represent the rules. Um, yet, I imagine, I hope, you're all finding it's incredibly difficult to work out how to code the game, how to represent the state of a chess game using objects. And that's because, well, someone tell me, why is it so hard? There's a lot of ways that you can win. There are lots of ways you can, oh, lots of ways you can win. Well, I thought you were going to say lots of ways you could represent it. Oh. Yeah, there's certainly lots of ways you could win. That's just the algorithm of the whole thing, though. I mean, that's just fiddly to get the algorithm right. What I find is quite tricky is working out how to actually get the right representation of the thing. What were you going to say? Uh, I was saying it's sort of the, like the way they move is simple in theory, but it's quite complicated the way they interact with other pieces. Yes, they've got interactions. So although they're simple, they've all got slightly different ways of interacting. Like you're thinking, for example, the pawn that moves differently, whether it's taking or moving, and the knight, which isn't blocked by anyone. And, the queen and the king, which each sort of have the same pattern of moving, but one can only do it once and one can do it forever, and all these other weird things like that. There are these similarities and differences, and so if you're trying to capture, if you're trying to represent everything just once, if you're trying to capture the pattern of movement just once rather than repeating things and, and having all your different pieces looking very similar but containing heaps of repeated stuff, it's quite tricky to do, and then it's also tricky to work out whose responsibility is what. Whose responsibility is it to know where a piece is? Should the board know where a piece is? Or should a piece know where a piece is? Or should a board and a piece know where a piece is? But if a board and a piece know where a piece is, what if they each think different things? You know, you've got to have some sort of invariant there that you have to maintain. That, you know, there's a bit of data duplication. So there's all these design issues because there's so many ways you could do it. And that's why I think it's a lovely task. Um, this task and the lock and, the, and your very next task, task 2.0, are, I think, the crux of the course. Oh, you're in the wrong lecture. Sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> what, what lecture is this? What's it, what course is this? I think I'm in the wrong lecture. <laughs> uh, yeah, OK. So it's a hard task. It's not hard because there's lots of coding. It's hard because there's lots of thinking, I hope you're finding. And the thinking is, Every time you think of one way of doing it, you can think of a slightly different way that seems a little bit better, and then another one, then another one, and you just seem to go on this never-ending path of fiddling and diddling. You could spend um, an enormous amount of time not actually coding anything at all, just trying to get these relationships between the objects right. Now, can I say, although in uh, practice, in, at work and things like that, obviously you can't spend forever on a really trivial problem, not that this is a trivial problem, it's fine and fitting and appropriate that this in your first real modeling exercise, it takes you an enormous amount of time because I want you to try and get it right. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you do get it exactly right or not, but I want you to try really hard to get it right so when you start looking at sample solutions and other students' code, you're really well placed to start to say, oh yeah, that's a really good design and oh, I see why they did that, and, but why did they do that? I think my way's better. And to be able to evaluate designs, I think you need to put a lot of work into thinking about it. So, um, so I think in summary, this is quite an important exercise. And the next one, 2.0, is an important exercise. So what I'd like you to do is look at the mark you got for um, task 1.1 for the combination lock. Look at how you go with this one and let that guide you with the next one. If you're not doing so well and you still haven't quite got the whole object modeling thing worked out, then put a lot of effort in looking at the model solutions we've put up already and thinking about it and just analyzing before you start on the next task. Because your next task is really the last task where we're just focusing on this. Then we're going to move on and focus on other things. So just set as a personal goal for yourself to make sure you get either this task or the next task, you get a really nice design for it. Um, now, the next task, you get two weeks to do because there's a, the break. So that gives you um, a bit of extra wiggle time. <sighs> OK, let's, now let's start the lecture. This week is an exciting week because uh, Google has, what have they done? They've uncensored China. They used to censor all the results they gave to the China at the request of the Chinese government. And just this week, Google have decided, no, bugger that. We're not going to censor. 
it's awesome. I wouldn't have believed a week ago that it could happen. I was really sad about Google. I've been sad about Google for a while, thinking it started off as a very idealistic company, and then it was sort of taken over by the suits, and there's lots of money there. So people interested in money are sort of running it. And I was thinking, ah, oh, sort of lost their way a bit. It's a bit sad, like Microsoft did and IBM before that. And, and now they've turned around and they've decided they're not going to censor results. So that's awesome. So they're trying to do the right thing rather than perhaps the thing that will make the Chinese government the happiest. Uh, and maybe that'll turn out to be economically the right thing, but I have a funny feeling they didn't do it for that reason. So I'm so proud of them. Now let's just think about the censorship that's going on in, uh, uh, what do you think of censoring the internet? <laughs> what's, the, what's the idea behind censoring the internet? Or any form of censorship? There's bad things which are harmful to society. There are bad things which are harmful to society, so society shouldn't be able to see them because it's not good for society. Yep. It's one? Think of the children. Well, actually, Australia has a long history of censorship. We're actually, of all the sort of Western developed countries, we're probably one of the worst for censorship. We've got a very, very censoring government and, and have had since the beginning of the colony days. Um, the idea behind censoring is shh, 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 shh. there's things that aren't good for society, so you shouldn't be able to see them or think about them or talk about them or know about them. And what's the danger with censorship? What's the problem? It sounds great. That sounded really convincing to me. I'm already going, oh, I quite like it then. Yes? Someone has to decide. Someone has to decide. So someone has to make up their mind what's right for everyone else. So this is what we call a paternalistic approach or a centralized approach. And as you can see, hopefully in this course, this course is all about the exact opposite. What's our approach in this course? Decentralized, push responsibility down, trust the underlings, don't try and control everything. Because if you control everything, remember you're a man with the power of a million people, but the brain of one. And in fact, I read this funny, no, crap, book a long time ago. <laughs> and you know, Mao was doing the Great Leap Forward, and this was a very long time ago, and apparently a, in this book was conjecturing, they were then thinking of the Great Leap Upwards was the next plan, and that was gonna be, everyone in China was gonna jump up at the same time. And when they landed all at the same time, it would cause earthquakes around the world. And then there was a great leap inwards when everyone in China was going to step into the sea and cause massive tsunamis and things. But you can see these sorts of things are a parody of this sort of centralized thought, which is one person makes a decision, you've got the power of many people, so you can do things that just require brute force for many people, but you don't have lots of brains. So censoring is actually quite, I think, bad as an academic, because I think ideas emerge best when everyone's thinking and everyone's critiquing and everyone's analyzing. Not when one person's trying to work out the best thing for everyone, because no matter how good that person is, and Senator Conroy is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> diversity is fantastic and can outperform um, individuals no matter how good the individuals are. So, um, what would, you know what the main things that were being censored in China, by the way? Yeah, yeah, examples, Tiananmen Square. People in China aren't even allowed to know that it happened, Tiananmen Square, terrible thing. I remember when it happened, it actually, I, I was just so shaken, I was hearing it happen as it was happening, it was just the worst thing in the world. What else? What's that? Truth. truth? Yes, you're not allowed to know about truth. No, let's be silly. That's being silly. No, you're not allowed to know about Tibet. There can be no debate about the whole Tibet problem. You're not allowed to know about Taiwan. And so Senator Conroy has actually gone to China and suggested that all they have to do is lock everything in Wikipedia starting with T. <laughs> That's brilliant. See, this is the uh, Australian uh, clever way of censoring. Okay, now um, I've been looking at everyone's design task for as it's been evolving, and I've been talking to your tutors who have been walking around looking at it uh, in the labs, and can I just give a summary of design task four? It seems to me that everyone's finding it quite hard. People are putting a lot of effort into it, and I was reading someone's report last night, and that person was saying, uh, here's our code, but we failed, was their summary. Essentially, they'd stopped working on it already. We failed because we can uh, only implement one task, which is the is check function. We haven't been able to do any of the other things, and uh, you know, it's this disaster. And they were sounding really depressed. And I just wanted to say to that person, whoever they are, or those two people, um, and, but really to everyone, that I am very proud of your attempts for design task four. And when I was reading, we have failed, we've only got check working, we're going to give up and stop now because we're out of time, I was thinking, right on, that's fantastic. And I was just bursting with pride for that person because that is a really good outcome. Here's a bad outcome. We worked really, really hard and we tried really, really hard and we just had all these great ideas but the end, pfft, nothing. 
And I, did all, I worked all night the night before, and I left my other subjects down, and we just burned each other out, and pfft, nothing. And that wasn't what they'd done. What they'd done is they'd broken it into tasks, and they'd gone through getting the tasks right one at a time. They'd only been able to get the first task right in the amount of time they'd budgeted for it, and then they'd stopped and moved on to other things that they had to move on to. This is awesome. That's exactly what you should be doing. Work out how much time and resources you're going to devote to the problem. Pick a problem that you can solve in that amount of time with a really good outcome that you can get really right, and then do that. That's a million times better than faffing around and having nothing and being stressed and burnt out at the end. So that was just fantastic. So the, I guess, benefit of doing Design Task 4, from my point of view, is I want to see you grapple with it. It doesn't matter whether you get the perfect answer or not. What matters is that you think very, very hard about what the perfect answer would be. And maybe you can't create it, but hopefully you'll, when you see it, you'll recognize it. Or a good answer you'll see. It. So that was really good. So I'm very proud of everyone who's working hard on Design Task 4. Do not be discouraged. You're doing exactly the right thing. And yes, get check working. And only, if, and only think about check when you're writing the check function. Don't think about anything else. Don't worry about mate or check mate or mate in one. And then only when you've got check working, Think about checkmate. And don't think about made in one move. No, no, that's tomorrow's. Maybe we'll never get any time to look at it. Don't even waste a second thinking about that. Get, mate in, um, get checkmate working perfectly. And only when you've got that working perfectly do you think about um, made in one move. Yeah, yeah? That's the perfect way of approaching it. Don't forget everyone gets two late days per Platypiad. So if you haven't used it up, if you haven't handed anything late so far, you and your partner can hand this in up to two days late, um, and that's accepted. CRC cards. Now, someone talked about CRC cards, and I can't remember who it was. Was it Benjamin? Who was talking about it? Wave at me. It was you. Wave. No. Who was it? You? Who was it? Someone on the forum? I just, because I, I haven't said, see, I've sort of almost got to CRC cards. I was going to mention them in one lecture, and I haven't. I thought it'd be cool to get that person to talk about it. CRC cards are this. Remember, yeah, the whole problem with design is in compute, in OO, you look at the problem, there are a million ways you could do it. And literally, what I mean by here is there are many, many ways you could represent the class hierarchy. You could use inheritance, abstract classes, interfaces, extending, uh, uh, private, public, protected, different relationships, different patterns, if you know about design patterns. There's lots of things you could do to approach the problem, and you have to pick one. Actually implementing it and writing the code, you've already mastered that in first year. Yeah, that's the same as writing C code. You can do that. Here the trick is working out what the relationship is up front, working out what really the classes are and their relationship with each other. And this has always been the bane of object-oriented programmers. And I remember the first time I started programming Java, it used to freak me out because I'd think, oh, I can solve the problem this way, and I'd write a solution. And then I'd think, or I could solve it this way. And I'd come up with a completely different solution. Or I could do it this way, and I'd come up with another. And I had no sense of knowing which was a good one and which was a bad one, which was the best, which was the worst. It's very hard to evaluate them. And this has been the bane of OO programmers ever since OO has been around, which is, gee, what's a sensible way of identifying the objects and finding a decent relationship between objects? And, blah, blah, blah. and one pattern, one approach that um, is, used to be very popular, is much less popular now, but is still a really neat idea, is called CRC cards. Here's how the CRC card sort of thing works. The designers get around a table, a big table, and they're about to start talking now, saying, oh, no, we're doing Roma, and Roma's got dice, and Roma's got cards, and we've got points, and we've got money, and we've got whatever, and whatever. And they're starting to talk about all the things they've got. And every time they talk about some sort of nouny thing or something that might possibly be a class, they get a little piece of paper, an index card. You know, you probably haven't seen them because you guys have only known electronic libraries, but there's little things called index cards that are, I don't know, four by six or something like a postcard or a bit smaller. Has anyone seen index cards? Paper cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're fairly small. And what they do is every time they think of something that could be a class, they write the name of the class on the piece of paper. And they put it down on the table, face down. And everyone can see all the cards that are in play at any time. And they put three pieces of information on each card. They say the name of the class. And then they list its responsibilities, what it's sort of got to do, the reason for having this damn thing. So, Chess board, I might say, this card is a chess board. Its responsibilities are keeping track of the pieces, um, the location of the pieces, uh, 
displaying itself if it needs to be displayed. It might have two responsibilities. And you might say, chess uh, porn, its responsibility is working out something or something. And you just list them all. So you list what you think the responsibilities of the thing are. And then you list its collaborations. What things it has to talk to or know about. And I was leading up to, but never quite finished that with the engine exercise. Remember we did that with the engine? We said, oh, a car has an engine and it has wheels and has an accelerator, and has a brake, has a sunroof. And the CRC thing would be, we'd, write, we'd be wonky, putting one of these down on a card, each of these down on one card. And we'd have all those cards on the table and then we'd just start to move them around and talk about them. And we'd say, oh, the collaborations of engine are, um, well, the engine needs to know about the wheels. And the car needs to know about the engine. And the car needs to know about the accelerator and the accelerator needs to know about the wheels. And the car needs to know about the brake and the brake needs to know about the wheels. The car needs to know about the sunroof. And, and we just start writing it all down on these little bits of paper. And then what happens is as the design changes, you suddenly think, oh, I don't need that card anymore. No one's using it. It's got no reason. Or its responsibilities are in someone else's card now. So you just pick the card up and put it on the side. You don't throw it, delete it. You just sort of move it to the side. And you write a new card. And the idea is that writing these cards should be so easy and fast and quick that there's no pain to delete a class. It's not like if you've typed something, you know how much you hate changing it, so you'll normally get a really bad design and you'll not want to throw away and start again because it's real pain after you've typed it, so you'll... Has anyone done this with an English essay? If writing words is hard for you as it is for me, once you've written a sentence, you never want to lose that sentence because it costs you like 20 minutes to write that sentence. So you think, I don't need that sentence anymore. Oh, I'll put it to the side because maybe I can use it later on. I can use some of the words in that sentence. I've got a little tuples of words that go together quite nicely. Maybe I can cut and paste. So it's actually very hard to delete and change things. You sort of don't want to monkey around with it if it's a big pain. So the idea of these cards, you just jot them down a sec and you can write new ones in a sec, so it's no pain. And you're just constantly shuffling them around. And the trick is you're looking for cards which have too much responsibility. Once a card, and every time you think of a new responsibility, you work out who it belongs to and you write it on that card. What do you do if you think if you find a card with too much responsibility on it? And too much is how much? How much is too much responsibility for a card? Have a guess. More? Oh, yes. Did you know that already? Or did you just guess that? Clifford, you are awesome. Yes. So, uh, yes, too much to fit on a card. That's why the cards are quite nice. Write in reasonable size writing. If the card's all squishy and you can't fit everything in, the card's doing too much. What do you do if the card's got too many responsibilities? Split it. Pick up a new card and say, well, he can't do all that work. That's too much for him. I'll just take those away and I'll create a new class. And I'll move some of the responsibilities to that class. And then you could all argue about different ways of doing it. And you'll be constantly scribbling out bits and writing new things. And if a card gets too messy, throw it in the bin and write a neat version of it. It only takes a second. And you're just constantly keeping them and playing. And you're talking about it. And you're moving it around. But everyone's looking at the design. It's really visual. Everyone's understanding. Everyone's talking about it. And people start using their, analog their physical analogy sort of thing in the brain. So people will start saying, oh, and this thing. And they'll point to an area vaguely where a card is. And that guy looks after this. And you don't even have to look at the cards after a while. You start to get a feeling, oh, yeah, over there is where we look after, I don't know, validating account details. And, and does that make sense? So it gives you this really strong visual metaphor. And people just fool around. And then after a while, when the design's stable and settled, you just pick the cards up and you say, can you implement that card? You implement that card. You implement that. And everyone gets a class to do. Yeah? Why is it bad to have a that does too much. Oh, why is it bad to have a card that does too much? That's a fantastic question. So guys, tell me, and because I've got a terrible brain at the moment, being coldy, and also because I want you to think about it, why do you think it might be bad for a car to have too much responsibility? It makes it complicated. Why does it make it complicated? Yeah, I mean, within a class, you've got this, your scope modifiers aren't protecting you. Your private's not protecting you from things inside a class. So anything in a class can potentially interact with something else in a class. So you've got your normal thing that we have with abstractions. You've potentially got too much interaction. So that's a good thing. What's another reason? Um, that, that's, a, that's a spot on reason. Yeah. Say you've got like 100 lines of code. The amount of time it takes you to debug that if there's a bug in it yes. is uh, not half the amount of time that it takes to debug 200 lines of code. Yes. It takes. The amount of time it takes you to debug 100 lines of code or to understand 100 lines of code or to explain 100 lines of code or do any sort of cognitive task on 100 lines of code is not half as long as to do 200 lines of code. In fact, remember last year we conjectured it look sort of quadratic. Do you remember that? So it'll be four times as much. Why is that? Why does more code take longer? Part of the reason is this more interactions. 
But there are other reasons too. <coughs> yes? Uh, after a certain point, you can't fit it all in your mind anymore? Yeah, you can't fit it in your head. That's why Theo's right. If you've got a cold, you can only fit four things in your head. If you're really clever, you can fit seven things. Normal people can fit seven things in your head. If you're really, really clever, you can fit seven and a half things in your head. Seven things properly and misremember one or something, or maybe eight. But there's a limit to how much you can fit in your head. It's like a page, paging on the operating system. If you can fit everything in your head and you understand it, everything makes sense. But once it doesn't all fit into your head at once, then it's really hard to work with because you look at a little window on it and then you think, oh, and that interacts with, what did that, oh, that thing over there. And then you have to forget all that stuff you've got in there and read in this other part and you're not getting the advantages of abstraction. So human brains can't deal with too much complexity. We start becoming crap. It's easier for us if we've just got a simple, clear, thing to look at. Is that a good summary? Can you think of another reason why too many lines of code is bad? No? Okay, keep thinking. That's good. Everything's good. You guys are saying perfect things. Yes? It'd be good for you because you can fit it all on one screen. Yes, you can fit it all on one screen. Why is it good to fit all your code on one screen? Showing it to other people. Scrolling is exactly the same as this cognitive holding in your head. If you've got to debug a piece of code and you're scrolling up and down, you're doomed. If you've got to debug a piece of code and it goes over the width of the screen, you've got to be panning left and right, you're doomed. You want to be able to look at it? Yep, I got it, I understand it, it's correct, go. Yep, perfect. All right, so can I summarize this sort of general theory we've got here? Oh, don't tell me, I've got to remember it. I want to say it's Chen. Yes, yes it is. Chen, does that make sense, what we said, why we don't want too much? Can I just summarize the whole we don't want too much by saying we want each class because remember, we're arising, this whole reason for adopting OO, or the reason I gave at the beginning of the course is, problems are complex, we've got to solve complex problems, brains are good at doing some things and crap at doing other things, and one thing we're really good at understanding, oh, well, there are various things we're good at understanding, and a good way of learning and tricking your brain into helping you in things it's not familiar with is to use analogies. So if you can find something you understand really well, and then you can trick your brain, you can somehow rewrite the problem so it fits something you already understand really well, then your brain just deals with it better. So the idea is, we, that led to our notion of it's quite nice if these things model things. Even if they're modeling abstract concepts, we understand relationships between things, we understand how things interact in the world, so some sort of physicality to the whole thing. So it's very nice then if each class models just one thing, if it has just one job, if it has just one concept. So you want to deal with a student, you need the student class. You want to deal with a student's address, addresses are in the address class. You want to have a stack, it's in the stack class. Your lock's got wheels in it, well there's a lock which contains wheels and the details of the wheels are in the wheel class. And if there's a bar that goes up and down, it's not in the wheel class by proxy or extra functions, there's a bar class that goes up and down. All right. So. The other thing that can happen, by the way, when you're doing CRC cards is, what happens if you move all the responsibilities around and someone doesn't have any responsibilities at the end? Well, they've just got this really trivial responsibility, like record whether you're open or shut. What do you reckon? You can get rid of the class or merge it into another class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want your classes to do nothing. That's a waste of time. So, okay. Uh, so they're CRC cards, and we sort of did it with the engine thing, and it's a nice approach. Your, um, your reps at the moment are sort of grappling a little bit with how to test the, um, the, uh, the Roma game. And some of the discussions they're doing is just making me think, oh, they're almost sort of doing CRC cards, but they're doing on the forum, and it'd be nice if they could all get together and have little cards and move them around. Dave? Yeah, but, yes? Um, you said CRC cards are not so popular yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, um... By not so popular, I don't mean that everyone doesn't like them. I just mean initially all the OO people were sort of OO purists and everyone loved OO. Now I guess every man and his dog programs OO. So it might just be that, you know, a lot of people do, there's a lot of programmers in the world just writing web pages and stuff like that. So a lot of people just do the, I'll look at it, I'll think about it, I've got a reasonable idea, I'll write it down. Okay, but I want you guys to be designers. Uh, what could you have instead of CRC cards? Well, any tool that helps you tease out all the classes. Yeah. Um, so what are the tools and other methods? Well, there's, there's lots of other methods. Like, for example, um, if you're really into testing-driven development, which is called TDD, the idea of testing-driven development is you, work, you take everything I've said so far to the extreme. So you only write code when you have a test. So you sit down and you write a little test, 
and then you write the bare minimum amount of code you've got to write to make that test pass, even if you're just faking it and echoing the right answers back. And then you refactor to make the thing look nice, and then you add a new test, and then you refactor, and you get everything working, then you refactor, preserving the correctness but changing the structure of the code so it looks nicer. And if you do TDD to the nth degree, the steps you're doing are so small, so the incremental steps are so tiny that um, the, the design of the classes just sorts of seems to emerge as you go rather than this big all up the front planning sort of exercise. Not that, to say that if you're a TDD person and you add one tiny little test and suddenly everything's got to change, that I guess could happen. It could suddenly tip you over the balance. You might well deal out the cards, but a lot of them you know, can probably just handle it in their heads. They just do TDD as they, TDD gives you class design as you go. Um, other methods, I'll look for other methodologies if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do I do? Um, I don't do CRC cards on cards because I guess as a lecturer I'm rarely collaborating with other people. I mean the nice thing about that is it's a, everyone's looking at it, it's this sort of collaborative design exercise. I'm often inventing a bit of code in my head at night to show you guys the next day or something like that. It's a sad and lonely life being a lecturer. Uh, so I'll, I'll do it with scribbles and paper and on whiteboard and things like that but they won't necessarily be cards. Um, yeah, but I quite like the card approach. Gee, if I had some cards I'd probably do it. Um, I have done CRC cards once or twice as sort of just trying them out exercises, uh, and it was great. Yeah, it's just a tool for teasing it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so that was whoever mentioned CRC cards. Good on you for mentioning them, and uh, I'm glad I was able to finally get back. And that was something I was going to mention after we we're doing the engine development. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was Mario. Oh, did you have a point? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what does CRC stand for? What does CRC stand for? Can anyone guess? Class, responsibility, collaboration. The three things that are on the card. Yeah. Uh, Mario. Where are you, Mario? Wave at me. Yeah, oh, there you are in the middle. I was just thinking about what Mario did the other day. You remember Mario came and showed you about the robo battle thing? I can't even remember what it's called now. Robo wars? Robo? Robo code. Um, and it was awesome. It was fantastic. And I really liked it. And it was his idea to show you, and it was perfect, and it fitted into the course exactly. And when he asked me if he could do it, I just fell over backwards with excitement because it was just so spot on. But what made me even more happy was just that you thought of doing it. And I thought I should just mention to everyone that this is exactly what I reckon you should be doing. The idea is you go out and find things yourself that you're interested in that help you learn and help you understand. And that's wonderful. That's taking control of your own education. But then you share it with your peers so everyone benefits. And my hope is, and it has happened in previous years, um, in fact, UNSW is really good at doing this C at CSE, that by the end of your degree, you'll come out and you guys will be fairly tight-knit and everyone will sort of know everyone and you'll have a bit of respect for everyone and you'll be helping each other all the time. And I see you guys helping each other. Thurston and Rupert come in here. They do all the stuff they're doing. They're really just doing it to help people. They, I don't know if we get any money for it at all. We give Rupert as much snot as he needs. How are you going? No, he's still got some there, just there. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I mean, it's really a wonderful school of people helping each other. So, and the other thing is, there's something about an idea that when you explain it to someone, you reach, I, I believe, I've noticed in my own life, when I explain something, I understand it much better than if I just read it and thought, yeah, I get it. Because there's the, yeah, I get it, and there's the, yeah, I get it, and now I have to tell someone else. And there's no faking when you tell someone else. You've really, really, really got to get it. So I often find explaining things over and over again, or even just ones, uh, helps me understand it much more. So what I wanted to say was, I, I should formalize this thing that you've just invented, Mario, which is if anyone at any time would like to present something on some topic, I will carve out a bit of time in our lecture four in any week for anyone that wants to do it. So you just think amongst yourselves, if there's something interesting you've found or that you want to show other people or you want to have just a whack at explaining things, you might be interested in being a lecturer yourself one day or you might just be interested in improving your communication skills or you might just want to show something really neat you've discovered, some really excellent tool for replacing CRC cards or for doing collaborative work you know, remotely or whatever, please just come and tell me and um, I'll give you a few minutes or as long as you need at the start of a lecture. Now, when you did it, Mario, remember at the end you said to me, oh, that was different to how I thought it would be because it went much slower. You thought you'd cover this much, but you only get to cover that much. And that's one of the things about, I, I find, when you present things to people, the pace at which you can present is much, much slower if you really want people to understand than the pace you think you're going to present at. And each week you'll notice I regularly have a whole lot of points down the bottom that I wistfully think I might get to and I never do and they fold over into the next week. Um, so if you are interested in learning about presenting and how to design a good lecture, 
or how to design a good presentation or a good teaching thing, then that would be a great opportunity. Whew, that's all the admin. Look at that. <laughs> all right, but that was all good stuff. Now, um, why did we talk about the Greeks initially? We did talk about the Greeks on and on and on about the Greeks. I still think about them and dream about them. They're a wonderful race. Why did we talk about them? They had good design. What were they designing that was good? Uh, the society. Yeah, like a political system, a social infrastructure, in particular a way of transmitting power and electing people and devolving responsibility. All right, that was cool. It was versus the idea of a tyrant, a person in control, centralized, controlling everything, knowing best for everyone. Now, the example that I want to sort of draw to everyone's attention is this. Let's look at, I mean, it's actually relevant to Java. This is sort of the whole idea behind Java design. I don't think I've made it explicit enough yet. Suppose you had a pawn class, and you had a rook class, and you had a, a, a queen class, and so on. You have all these little classes. You're playing chess. And you've got some sort of, I don't know, can move to function that given a, a piece, these are all pieces maybe, they implement a piece interface. Um, you got a piece and you got a, I don't know, a destination and it returns true or false whether that piece can move to that destination. And you put this in your chess thinker class and, and the body looks something like, um, uh, you, you say, uh, type, the, uh, I don't want to use the word type, uh, um, what should we call the different sorts of pieces? Or we'll say sort, sort, the sort of piece sort equals uh, the piece dot get sort. And you could give each of these two classes something that returns a string that's its sort. So the, the pawn class could return the word pawn when you call get sort. And the rook class could return the word rook when you call get sort. And the queen sort could return queen, the string queen when you do the get sort. So then you've allocated the sort into this variable here called sort. And now you know what sort of piece you're dealing with. And then you could do something like if sort is equal to queen, or maybe it's just q if you're being terse, do this, else if, you know, work out the queen move, else if sort is equal to rook, well, then we'll do all the rook calculations, else if, and at the end of the whole thing we'll return whatever the answer was. Return, uh, yeah, answer. That's right, and this is uh, somehow in here it's assigning answer equals the end of each of these. Okay, you could write it like that. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's Java will let you write it like that. That's fine, it looks a bit like a C program. Except you've got these sort of more elaborate structs. But is that the Greek way of doing things? Or is that the Egyptian way of doing things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the ruler that knows everything and the minions that are just nothing. And he makes all the decisions and does all the thinking for everyone. We could call him, what could we call him? Conroy. <laughs> and these things here just are pushed around because they're just pathetic and can't think for themselves. This is a possible solution, but it's not the sort of solution we're looking for. What's the sort of solution we're looking for? Whenever we see a whole chain series of if statements like this, what are we instantly thinking? Move it to the pieces. Delegate. So we shouldn't be letting each piece just identify what it is and then switching on all different alternatives in here. Instead, every piece should have a can move to function. And the code from this one can go in this guy's can move to function. And the code from this one can go in this guy's can move function. Rip it all out. Splat, 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 splat. And then every piece now has a can move to function that knows where it can move to. And then your code here now becomes much simpler. You simply say, can move, well, if you needed to do this, you, you don't even need to do this anymore, but if you did, you just say answer equals piece dot can move to test. Say that again. Oh, well, like with the piece, like no, uh, it doesn't matter. 
Yeah, I mean, there's all these questions here. Do the piece know where it is? You know, you'd have to work out the responsibility of the piece and where the information is. But if the pieces knew where they were, and they knew the relationship with the board, and they knew where everyone else was somehow, maybe a piece has a link to a board, and the board has all the information, you know, it might be that way. Then you can work it out. If not, we'd have to pass more information in here to make the decision. Sure. But the idea is, all of that mess gets replaced with this. And all of those blocks that we were selecting between, they're now selected for us automatically, depending on which piece it's passed to us. So if we're given the pawn, then we use pawn dot, the, the pawn dot uh, can move to function is selected automatically, because when we go can move to, we're running the function that belongs to that piece. So n I never want to see big case statements working it out. You're, you're taking control. Devolve it, push it down. Has anyone done that in their code? Yeah, 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 people have done it. Okay, so it's a, what we call a design smell. When you see something like that, you go, smell doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's suspicious. In the past, I've seen lots of bad code that's done this, so I'm suspicious whenever I see it. And you might have the world's best argument why it's the right thing to do, and maybe you can persuade your tutor, and then that's cool, yeah? Any design that is clear on its own merits is fine, but normally when you see that, it's a bad thing. You're not giving responsibility down, you're not pushing it down. If you did that, how big would this function be? Would it fit on a screen? No way. No, no. Okay. All right, so that's good. All right, let's keep going. Does anyone have a question out of that? Yeah, shoot. Oleg is your tutor. He's a very smart guy. Ah, Oleg, Dr. Starmark, if you had a function over 50 lines long, that warms the cockles of my heart. That's fantastic. But I would actually say, and I remember teaching Oleg in his first year, I used to document Starmark if any function didn't fit on the screen. Now, how many lines have you got on your screen? 200. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure it was only 24 in those days. We had a CGA monitor. Or something like that. So yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, keep them short. In fact, what we'll be looking at in the second lecture, in the design lecture, I'll be talking about the 1010 principle, which is, I expect your classes to have no more than 10 methods. And I expect each method to have no more than 10 lines in it. And if you've got methods with more than 10 lines in it, they're doing a lot of stuff. That looks like something that should be broken down. And if you've got more than 10 methods in your class, that class has got a lot too much responsibilities. It's trying to be two people at once. It's got a split personality. Split it into the two. Give one of them a really clear name saying what it does and give it those responsibilities and the rest into someone else with those responsibilities. Yeah, maybe it shouldn't look after its address. Maybe it shouldn't look after printing its address as well as looking after working out if things are in check. Maybe that's two jobs. Maybe you need one class to work out one and one to work out the other. Just wait and see. Yeah, so that's a great thing. Good old Oleg. Okay, uh, we won't talk about that anymore. I just want to race quickly through constructors and I'm going to show you some code. Hmm. I'll show you a little bit of code and then we'll have a break and then I'll show you some more code. Constructors, a call to create the class, so uh, the object. So whenever you've got a class, if you want one of them, Java has to make it for you. And you, it does all the malics and all that pain, so it does it for you. But you've got to ask it to make it for you. And you do that by saying new. And when you say new, it runs a constructor function to build the thing. And the constructor function, Behind the scenes does all sorts of magic. It, oh, I don't even know if the constructor function does it. Before the constructor function is called, memory is allocated for all the local attributes, initializes a run. So if you've given your attributes an initial value, that's all evaluated before the constructor runs. And then the constructor runs and does any code you've given it to do to set the object up, to establish its invariance, to, to make it semantically make sense, the object. Now, Let's just, there's just a tiny bit of Java syntax I don't know if we've done. What's the uh, purpose of a constructor? The purpose of a constructor is different to the purpose of a normal method. I just want to contrast constructors with methods, normal methods, other methods. The purpose of a method is to do something, but the purpose of a constructor is just to set something up. If you don't write a constructor in any class, I think I've probably said this, Java sticks one in automatically for you, and it takes no arguments and it does nothing, but it's stuck in there automatically for you. So every object you can make with, every object that hasn't, uh, if you've written a class and haven't given any constructors to make a new one, suppose your class is called um, leg, I can say L equals new leg, bracket, bracket, nothing inside, because there's a constructor with bracket, bracket, nothing inside, given to it by Java if you haven't given it one. However, if you give it one, if he writes a constructor himself, Java doesn't stick that default one in that does nothing. 
So if you want to be able to create it without passing any arguments in, you'll also have to create a constructor that takes no arguments. If, if, you, if you created a constructor that takes some arguments, the one that used to get automatically that took no arguments isn't given to you anymore. You actually have to write it yourself. Yeah. Uh, now, suppose you've got um, a couple of different constructors. In a second, we're about to make an animal. And we're going to say that the attributes of an animal, it's got all these attributes, who knows what they are. But one of it is every animal, animal's going to have a name, of course, because that's just polite and courteous, and every animal makes a sound. So when we construct an animal, we might want to specify its name and the sound it makes, in case anyone wants to know them in the future. But we also might want to have a constructor that when we make the animal, we can just specify its sound and it gets given a default name. And we might just want to have a default constructor that makes an animal with a default name and a default sound. So you might want to have three different constructors, which is fine. You write them as long as they've all got different type signatures. When you call it, Java can work out which one you're calling by the type signature of what you're passing in. But suppose each of them has to do all this setup. It would be a duplication of code to write all that setup stuff in all three of them. Sometimes what's convenient is you want to get one of the constructors to do a little special thing, and then you just want to say, call the other constructor. Get the other constructor to do all the work, and I'll just do the extra bits for this particular constructor. Does that make sense? You can call a constructor from another constructor, <laughs> which is crazy. It's very hard to call a constructor. You can't normally call a constructor, can you? You just say new, and Java automatically calls a constructor for you. <coughs> so inside an object, inside an object's constructor, if you want to call another constructor, you can, and the name of the other constructor is this. This. So inside one constructor, maybe, oh, I'll, I'll show you in a sec when we do it. We'll actually cut it live rather than me scribbling it on the blackboard. But the idea is you can use the word this to only inside a constructor to say you're referring to another constructor of that same object in defining that same class. You can only do it on the first line of the constructor too. After that, the compiler will start grumbling. And the idea there is you are essentially calling the other constructor to do the real construction, and that happens first, and then you do any extra special stuff to customize it after that. Uh, and why am I talking about the constructors? Well, because now we got up to inheritance, we, now have to think of, we need to think about them a little bit more than we have in the past, because there's a little bit of magic going on with constructors, if you stop and think for a sec. You're a class, and you're a class, and you extend him, which means you are a him, but you can have some extra stuff as well. Okay, you've got the subclassing relationship going on there. You inherit all his methods for free. You don't have to write them, you've got them now. You can have extra methods too. But you don't inherit his constructors. So you have to work out how to make yourself, yourself. Okay, you don't get his constructor methods. If you want to call your parent's constructor before doing some work yourself, then your constructor is allowed to call your parent's constructor only in the first line of the constructor, and that's called super, super to be your parents. Does that make sense? So the idea being, I don't know, Clifford, what are you? You're um, an animal, you're a mammal. You're the animal class, you're a mammal class. I want to make a new, an I want to make a new mammal. A mammal extends an animal. So a mammal has everything an animal has plus more. In the text, in the source code for mammal, I haven't bothered talking about the animal stuff, have I? Because that's the whole idea. I don't have to think about that. I, I inherited that for free. I don't have to talk about the special extra stuff that a mammal has, which is hair. I haven't shaved in honor of talking about mammals today. Okay. And neither do you. And you guys, you, uh, I should have picked someone who doesn't have a beard. It's ruining my whole example. Is there anyone here who's completely bald? No, but that's all right, because an animal can be a mammal, can't it? It just doesn't have to be. So that's okay. So, we're cool. so the idea is when I construct an animal, I have to do a whole lot of work. I have to build DNA and RNA and join everything together and do all sorts of elaborate stuff. When I construct a mammal, I just want to get an animal and then do extra things to it, put essentially stick hair on it or something like that. So I need to somehow get an animal. Yeah? I need to call the animal constructor I don't know how to build, you don't know how to build an animal, do you? You don't know how to turn an animal into a mammal. What extra things you have to do? So you say, animal, class, please make me an animal. And then I will do my extra things on top of it. And to do that, you go super, which is the name of your parent. 
And if you're calling the super, if you're calling the constructor of animal that doesn't expect any arguments, you just say super, open bracket, close bracket, and it calls that. He's no argument one. And if you wanted to call the animal constructor that takes a couple of arguments in, you'd go super, couple of arguments. And you have to do it in your first line, that builds the animal, and then you do your extra stuff. If you don't put it in, Java does it for you automatically. It'll automatically call your parent's super function is the first thing it does. But it will only call the super function that has no arguments. So if your parent's super function, if your parent's constructor, if your parents don't have a constructor which takes no arguments, if your parents don't have one of those, then the default thing that the program does to try and help you is not going to work. It's going to say, oh, you want a mammal? Sure, I'll just make an animal with no constructor. Because you didn't mention anything about making an animal, so I'll do it for you. And we don't have a constructor for animals with no parameters, so it'll complain. A compile time, so I can't do it. Whew, that was a long explanation, but does that make sense? And that, we call that auto magic. Now, let's look at a little bit of this example, and then we'll take a break. And we'll look at the rest after the break. Here we go. All right, here's uh, animal. It's got... Oh, can everyone see? Is it too light down the front? Do you want me to darken down the front? Yes? What does bar mean? Someone keeps making a bar sound. I nearly wrote that. You know everyone puts out Christmas lights at Christmas? I, I just can't bring myself to do it. But everyone else in my street does it as this sort of horrible, tortuous thing. So every time I drive home, my kids are looking at everyone else's house and going, oh, they're so beautiful, I love them. And we get to our house and it's all dark. <laughs> and they say, Dad, you're letting us down. And I think, oh, I just hate the idea of these lights everywhere. Just, I don't know why. I hate, ever since my dad used to beat me with lights, I don't know why. <laughs> so, so what I, wanted, what I wanted to do last year, but my wife caught me while I was in the middle of doing it and made me take it down, was I was going to write bar humbug in Christmas lights. <laughs> but she made me take it down. So that's, is that why you're saying bar? Bar. Bar. Okay, so here we go. An animal has some attributes. I've made them all protected. We should, probably should have made them private, shouldn't we? I've made them protected in anticipation that the subclasses might want to get hold of them. We probably should have made them private. Um, it's got, whether it's alive or not, it's got a name and it's got a noise and various other attributes. And here's a constructor for it. Now, do we have a constructor that takes no arguments? No. So if you want to make an animal, you can't say new animal. It won't work. You've got to go new animal and then give it its noise. OK. Uh, I gave it a default name called Sterrance. We can change that. And the noise is the noise that's passed in. Oh, oh there we go. And I think that's all. Oh, and a rename. So yeah, if you want to rename your animal, if you didn't like it, maybe it was a, a cat and you wanted to make it a kitten or something like that, you could rename it using the rename function and that changes the name to the new name. And we've got a two string function, so if you want to print it out, it'll say name says whatever their noise is, in quotes. And let's run it. Oh yeah, well, I've already run it here. Ah, that's what people are saying bar about. Constructing animal. Oh, and in the constructor I put a printout saying I'm constructing animal seek just so you can see where the constructor is called because we're about to have a chain of constructors and I want you to see the sequence they're called. So I'm constructing an animal and then it says, Sterrant says, bah. It wasn't very exciting, was it? But there you go. Now let's have an animal user. This uses the animal class. It's going to create a sheep, an animal which is a sheep. It's going to give it its sound which is bah. And it's going to print out the sheep. Oh, that's what created all this output down here. We've already been running it. <laughs> Does that all make sense? Yes. All makes sense. What a simple class. What am I just about to do to that class? And then we'll have a break. Extended. I'm going to extend it. I'm going to make a, a mammal. So let's make the mammal class. And when I say I'm going to, I did. Here's my mammal class. Mammal extends animal. And a mammal is everything an animal is, but it's also got a hair color. Uh, so to make a mammal, you need a constructor which um, uh, uh, is the noise of the mammal. And it gives it a default hair color of black. We'd better have like a, a hair dyeing function or something so we can change the color of uh, mammals. Otherwise, it'll all just be black hair. But let's start like that. Because I noticed all babies have black hair when they're born. I don't know why. Even blonde babies. Are black. I don't, it doesn't make any sense. So it's going to be born with black hair. And then maybe it'll change. Uh, and we've got a two-string function. So we overrode the parent's two-string function to say what? how hairy it was. So it'll say something like red hair, oh, black haired Sterrance says, oh, it doesn't fit on this line. Uh, black haired Sterrance says, uh. okay, but oh, 
Why is it not going to work? It's not going to compile. It's grumbling. Oh, and when it starts to construct it, it's going to say constructing mammal. So you'll see which construct it's calling. Someone tell me what the problem is. Why have I got that little cross there saying, I'm cross with you, Richard. This isn't going to compile. Yes. I haven't given it a no, 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 no. No, but remember, animal assigns a default name. The animal constructor only takes in a noise and it assigns a default name. Yep. It's, thank you, thank you, thank you, Irene. Irene, yes, thank you. It's put in the default super. I haven't, I haven't told it to make an animal, so it's just going to make one automatically for me, and it's going to do it here, isn't it? So it's magically stuck in. The code would be no different if I was to type it in myself. Super. Okay. Now the problem is what? Why doesn't that work? It didn't work when it happened automatically, and it doesn't like it when I type it in myself. Why doesn't it like it? I, I don't have a constructor in the parent, in the super. I like parents being called super. I'm going to ask my kids to call me super from now on. Um, in fact, you know, sometimes in families they say like John, and then they have John the second or John Jr. I, I'd rather just, if I had a boy, I'd have called him Richard, and then they could have called me Super Richard. <laughs> what do you reckon? And he could have been Sub Richard. <laughs> oh, unless my dad had done it, then that wouldn't have been good. But it would have been good if I'd done it. Okay, so uh, yeah, we don't have a super constructor with no arguments. Oh, that's sort of what you were saying, isn't it? That's what you were saying. What's your name? Sean. Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so to construct an animal, what do I need to pass in, Sean? What does the animal need to know? Let's look at the animal. It's noise. Okay. So what noise is a mammal going to say? <laughs> no, I'm also going to say no, I like... But the mammal doesn't have a noise. It's a noise. Oh, oh yeah, it's being passed a noise, so I can just pass that noise straight on. Noise. All right, there you go. No, that's not going to work. Now it's going to say the word noise <laughs> rather than the noise it's passed in. I did that deliberately. Okay, so... Is everyone cool with this? The little thing's gone away, everyone's happy now, and we're going to go compile. Constructing animal, Steren says bar. Hang on, what happened there? Uh, because animal user, what's it making? It's making an animal, but what do I want it to make? Mammal, so let's better change that up. Let's say animal uh, m equals new mammal. And let's say it says something like, he's fallen in the water. That's what most animals say by mammals say by default. And then it's going to print out sheep. Well, we don't want to print out sheep. What do we want to print out? M. So notice, in both cases we're saying, whoop, in both cases we're saying M is an animal, because it is an animal in both cases, but we're using the mammal constructor for one, so it'll be a mammal and an animal. Yeah, yeah, because all mammals are mammals and animals. It'll be a mammal, but that also means it's an animal. And the other one, ah, oh, you get it, okay. Let's go. Boom, boom. So what happened? Let's have a look at what happened here. Constructing an animal. Oh, that's the first test. Let me just lock out. First test there. And recompile. So first, the animal constructor is called, because super gets called. When we're creating a new mammal, mm -hmm, creating a new mammal, the first thing that happens is super is called. Super calls the animal constructor, where is it? Here. Prints out, stop that. Constructing animal, constructing animal. Then it assigns the name Sterens. And then it assigns the noise. And then it terminates, so the animal constructor's finished. And we jump back to the mammal constructor. We've just finished the animal constructor. Now we print out constructing mammal, constructing mammal. Then we assign it a hair color, or him a hair color. And then we print out, oh no, and then we've finished, we've constructed it. And now let's go back to our, oh, that's the wrong place, animal user. Uh, we've just created the mammal, and now we're going to print out the mammal. Blackhead, Sterrant says, he's fallen in the water. All right, cool. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. We're going to take a break, and then after the break, we'll return for some more of this. <laughs>